Unit 3, Esperanza Unit Test. <clears throat> Part 1, Core Knowledge of the Novel. Directions. Do your best to answer these questions based on your understanding of the novel in Esperanza Rising. You may use your book to help you answer the questions. Number 1, in what country does the novel begin? A, the United States. B, Mexico, C, China, D, Canada. Number two, what is Esperanza's life like in the United States? A, it is different from her old life. She must work hard and take care of the babies. B, it is different from her old life. She is very wealthy and is treated like a queen. C, it is similar to her old life. She works hard every day and their family does not have much money. D, it is similar to her old life. She lives a life of luxury and does not do much work. Number three, what event causes Esperanza to begin working in the fields? A, Isabel drops out of school and resumes taking care of the babies. B, Mama becomes sick with valley fever. C, Miguel becomes injured and is unable to work. D, their cabin burns down and the family needs more money to rebuild. Number four, how is Abuelita able to come to the United States? A, Abuelita, Abuelita sneaks out with the help of her friends at the convent. B, Mama fakes her illness and is secretly retrieves Abuelita. C. Miguel takes the money Esperanza has saved and secretly leaves to bring Abuelita to America. D. The family hides Abuelita in a chest where they originally come to America. Part 2. Application to Esperanza Rising. Number 5. Read the following two excerpts from Esperanza Rising below. Excerpt one, page 69. Esperanza opened her valise to check on the doll, lifting it out and straightening out her clothes. The barefoot peasant girl ran over. Mana, she said, and reached up to touch the doll. Esperanza quickly jerked it away and put it back in the valise, covering it with the old clothes. Mana, Mana said the little girl, running back to her mother, and then she began to cry. Mama and Hortensia both stopped their needles and stared at Esperanza. Mama looked across at the girl's mother. I am sorry for my daughter's bad manners. Esperanza looked at Mama in surprise. Why was she apologizing to these people? She and Mama shouldn't even be sitting in this car. Excerpt 2, page 141. The babies cried and never went back to sleep. Both dirtied their diapers again. The weighted pal by the door grew. They must be ill, worried Esperanza. Did they have the flu or was it something they ate? No one else had been sick recently. What hadn't they eaten today? Only the milk and the plums. The plums, she groaned. They must have been too hard on their stomachs. What did Hortensia give her when she was a child and was sick? She tried to remember. Rice water. But how did she make it? Esperanza put a pot on the stove and added a cup of rice. She wasn't sure how much water to add, but she remembered that when rice didn't come out soft, Hortensia always said it needed more water. She added plenty and boiled the rice. She sat on the floor and fed them teaspoons of rice water all afternoon, counting the minutes until Isabel walked through the door. Number five, based on the excerpts, how would you describe the differences in Esperanza's response to her challenges? A, in excerpt number two, Esperanza takes more responsibility for her actions and responds with more maturity. B, in excerpt number two, Esperanza proves that she is still just as irresponsible as she was in the beginning. C, in both excerpts, Esperanza responds immaturely to the situation she is facing. 
D, Esperanza only thinks of herself in excerpt number two, which is different than excerpt number one. Number six, how would you describe Esperanza's character change in the novel? A, Esperanza becomes more selfish and less helpful to her family and community. B, Esperanza becomes less self-centered and more aware of how her actions impact others. C, Esperanza becomes very bitter about the world and does not believe that good things can happen. D, Esperanza becomes a leader helping to secure better rights for her fellow workers. Number seven, why are the roses that Miguel and Alfonso plant important? A, they represent the hardship that the family has been through in America. B, they represent Esperanza's birthday and the celebrations they used to have. C, they represent the beauty and joy found in their new life in America. D, they represent the connection between their old life at the ranch and their new life in America. Number eight, reread this section of the novel, page 246. Mountains and valleys, mountains and valleys. So many of them, thought Esperanza. When a strand of her hair fell into her lap, she picked it up and wove it into the blanket so that all of the happiness and emotion she felt at this moment would go with it forever. What are the mountains and valleys that Esperanza describes? Remember that she is literally talking about knitting, the knitting she does with Abelita. A, the mountains and valleys are the highs and lows that Esperanza and her family have experienced in the past year. B, the mountains and valleys are visual representations of the California setting where Esperanza lives. C, the mountains and the valleys represent how people treated Esperanza during the past year. D, the mountains and valleys represent the crops that are grown and picked on California's farms. Number nine, reread this section of the novel, page 250 to 251. Esperanza is describing her visions as she listens to the heartbeat of the earth. Then she flew over a river, a thrusting torrent that cut through the mountains. And there in the middle of the wilderness was a girl in a blue silk dress and a boy with his hair slicked down, eating mangoes on a stick carved to look like exotic flowers, sitting on a grassy bank on the same side of the river. What is the significance of the way the river is described here? A. Esperanza may forgive Miguel for going to get Abelita. B, Esperanza and Miguel will be able to start a family together by this river. C, Esperanza may finally be coming to see herself and Miguel as true equals. D, Esperanza and Miguel will no longer be friends since the vision is in the past. Number 10, open response. What is the theme in the novel Esperanza Rising? Write a complete powerful paragraph. You may use your book to help you. At this moment, you can go ahead and pause to work on this question, writing your powerful paragraph. Part three, application in a new text. The following passage is taken from a short story called The Scholarship Jacket, written by Mar Marta Salinas. Read the passage, then answer the questions that follow. The Scholarship Jacket. The small Texas school that I went to had a tradition carried out every year during the eighth grade graduation. A beautiful gold and green jacket, the school colors, was awarded to the class valedictorian, the student who had maintained the highest grades for eight years. The scholarship jacket had a big gold S on the left front side and your name written in gold letters on the pocket. My oldest sister, Rosie, had won the jacket a few years back and I fully expected to also. I was 14 and in the eighth grade. I had been a straight A student 
since the first grade and this last year had looked forward very much to owning that jacket. My father was a farm laborer who couldn't earn enough money to feed eight children. So when I was six, I was given to my grandparents to raise. We couldn't participate in sports at school because there were registration fees, uniform costs, and trips out of town. So even though our family was quite athletic, there would never be a school sports jacket for us. This one, the scholarship jacket, was our only chance. One day, I was walking through the hallway at school when I heard voices raised in anger as if in some sort of argument. I stopped. I didn't mean to eavesdrop. I just hesitated, not knowing what to do. I recognized the voices, Mr. Skimnick, my history teacher, and Mr. Boone, my math teacher. They seemed to be arguing about me. I couldn't believe it. I still remember the feeling of shock that rooted me flat against the wall as if I were trying to blend in with the graffiti written there. I refuse to do it. I don't care who her father is. Her grades don't even begin to compare to Martha's. I won't lie or falsify records. Martha has straight A plus average and you know it. That was Mr. Smitty. He and he sounded very angry. Mr. Boone's voice sounded calm and quiet. Look, Joanne's father is not only on the board, he owns the only store in town. We could say it was a close tie and the pounding in my ears drowned out the rest of the words. Only a word here and there fluttered through. Martha is Mexican, resign, won't do it. Mr. Simnick came rushing out and luckily for me went down the opposite way toward the auditorium so he didn't see me. Shaking, I waited a few minutes and then went in and grabbed my bag and fled from the room. I went home very sad and cried into my pillow that night so grandmother wouldn't hear me. It seemed a cruel coincidence that I had overheard the conversation. The next day, when the principal called me into his office, I knew what it would be about. He looked uncomfortable and unhappy. I decided I wasn't going to make it any easier for him, so I looked him straight in the eyes. He looked away <clears throat> and fidgeted with the papers on his desk. Martha, he said, there's been a change in policy this year regarding the scholarship jacket. As you know, it has always been free. He cleared his throat and continued. This year, the board has decided to charge $15, which still won't cover the complete cost of the jacket. I stared at him in shock and a small sound of dismay escaped my throat. I hadn't expected this. He still avoided looking in my eyes. So if you are unable to pay $15 for the jacket, it will be given to the next, in, next one in line. I didn't need to ask who that was. Standing with all the dignity I could muster, I said, I'll speak to my grandfather about it, sir, and let you know tomorrow. I cried on the walk home from the bus stop. The dirt road was a quarter mile from the highway. So by the time I got home, my eyes were red and puffy. I went outside and looked out at the fields. There he was. I could see him walking between the rows. His body bent over the little plants, hoe in hand. I walked slowly out to him, trying to think how I could best ask for him for the money. There was a cool breeze blowing and a sweet smell of mesquite fruit in the air, but I didn't appreciate it. I kicked at a dirt clod. I wanted that jacket so much. It was more than just being a valedictorian and giving a little thank you speech for the jacket on graduation night. It represented eight years of hard work and expectation. I knew I had to be honest with Grandpa. It was my only chance. He saw my shadow and looked up. He waited for me to speak. I cleared my throat nervously and clasped my hands behind my back so he wouldn't see them shaking. Grandpa, I have a big favor to ask you, I said in Spanish, the only language he knew. He still waited silently. I tried again. Grandpa, this year, the principal said the scholarship jacket is not going to be free. It's going to cost $15, and I have to take the money in tomorrow. Otherwise, it'll be given to someone else. The last words came out in an eager rush. Grandpa straightened up tiredly and leaned his chin on the hoe handle. 
He looked out over the field that was filled with tiny green bean plants. I waited, desperately hoping he could say I could have the money. If you pay for it, Marta, it's not a scholarship jacket, is it? Tell your principal I will not pay $15. I walked back to the house and locked myself in the bathroom for a long time. I was angry with grandfather, even though I knew he was right, and I was angry with the board, whoever they were. Why did they have to change the rules just when it was my turn to win the jacket? Those were the days of belief and innocence. It was a very sad and withdrawn girl who was dragged into the principal office the next day. This time, he did look me in the eyes. What did your grandfather say? I sat very straight in my chair. He said to tell you he won't pay $15. The principal muttered something I couldn't understand under his breath and walked over to the window. He stood looking out at something outside. Why, he finally asked, your grandfather has the money. He owns a 200-acre ranch. I looked at him, forcing my eyes to stay dry. I know, sir, but he said if I had to pay for it, then it wouldn't be a scholarship jacket. I stood up to leave. I guess you'll just have to give it to Joanne. I hadn't mean to say that. It just slipped out. I was almost to the door when he stopped me. Martha, wait. I turned and looked at him, waiting. What did he want now? I could feel my heart pounding loudly in my chest. Something bitter tasting was coming up in my mouth. I was afraid I was going to be sick. I didn't need any sympathy speeches. He sighed loudly and went back to his big desk. He watched me, biting his lip. Okay, we'll make an exception in your case. I'll tell the board you'll get your jacket. I could hardly believe my ears. I spoke in a trembling rush. Oh, thank you, sir. Suddenly, I felt great. I didn't know about adrenaline in those days, but I knew something was pumping through me, making me feel as tall as the sky. I wanted to yell, jump, run the mile, do something. I ran out so I could cry in the hall where there was no one to see me. At the end of the day, Mr. Shimnick winked at me and said, I hear you're getting the scholarship jacket this year. His face looked as happy and innocent as a baby's, but I knew better. Without answering, I gave him a quick hug and ran to the bus. I cried on the walk home again, but this time because I was so happy. I couldn't wait to tell Grandpa and ran straight to the field. I joined him in the row where he was working. The principal said he's making an exception for me, Grandpa, and I'm getting the jacket after all. That's after I told him what you said. Grandpa didn't say anything. He just gave me a pat on the shoulder and smiled. He pulled out the crumpled red handkerchief that he always carried in his back pocket and wiped the sweat off his forehead. Better go see if your grandmother needs any help with supper. I gave him a big grin. He didn't fool me. I skipped and ran back to the house whistling some silly tune. Number 11, what does Martha, Martha, the narrator, mean when he says he didn't fool me? Paragraph 31, A, the narrator realizes that her grandfather secretly hoped she would not receive the scholarship jacket. B, the narrator realizes her grandfather is a little too emotional about the outcome, but is trying to hide his emotion. C, the narrator realizes that her grandfather secretly paid the principal for the scholarship jacket. D, the narrator realizes that her grandmother truly needs help and she should have checked in first with her grandmother. Number 12, how does Martha react to her grandfather's decision not to pay for the jacket? A, she understands completely and does not question him. B, she decides to secretly raise money to pay for the jacket. C, at first she understands the decision, but later begins to question it. D, she is upset, but knows this is the way it should be. Number 13, reread this line from paragraph 27. His face looked as happy and innocent as a baby's, but I knew better. The narrator is describing her teacher, Mr. Shimdip. What does her description mean? A, her teacher is just hearing about the news about the jacket. 
B, her teacher does not have any facial hair and is very young. C, her teacher is acting like he knows less than he really does. D, her teacher is faking his happiness for Martha. He was rooting for Joanne. Number 14, which statement would the author of the scholarship jacket most likely agree with? A, striking is, import is an important way to help workers receive the rights, benefits, and compensation they deserve. B, life is easier for some people and harder for others based on who they are and where they were born. C, people must not be afraid to start over when you are treated unfairly. D, people of all different backgrounds have united throughout history to help one group be treated more fairly. 15, open response. How does Martha's grandfather respond to the challenge they face? Write a complete, powerful paragraph. You can pause the video so you can work on writing your powerful paragraph. 